So today we're going to talk about upgrading security while you're doing your R12 upgrade. And so Jeff and I today are going to walk through and talk about this from a security perspective and also from a controls perspective. So to give you a little introduction, I'll let Jeff introduce himself first. Hi, I'm Ed and welcome to everybody as well. Um, just a little, a little background on me. I'm a CCA by trade, but also have two uh, internal audit designations, CIA and CISA, for the auditors in the crowd. Uh, I've been working with the app since 1998, um, started out as a client, have been consulting for um, most of that, about 12 of those 14 years. Um, I have some background in Big Six Audit, um, six and a half years in CFO control roles, and I'm the author of the uh, one and only book on application security that's published, uh, Oracle New Business Week Control Application Security Best Practices. Thanks, Jeff. Again, my name is Steve Coast. I'm the CTO and founder of Integrity. As those of you not familiar with Integrity, we've been working and helping protect the Oracle Business Week for the last 10 years. And we actually do two things. One is consulting, so we do security assessments and risk assessments for Oracle Business Suite environments. And we also have a product that called App Sentry that helps automate our security assessment processes. So when our consultants can't be on site, uh, customers can buy App Sentry to help do that process. Personally, I've been working with the Oracle Business Suite for 16 years. Um, got into security about 12 years ago, and was one of the key authors of the Oracle's best practices for securing the Oracle Business Suite. So that's enough about us, and so we'll kind of start getting into the presentation here. So today's topic is why do you want to do security during your R12 upgrade? And so we're going to walk around through kind of some scenarios, talking about what are the key things that you should be doing to your upgrade and why you should include security in it. And we'll talk about some of the new features in within R12, talk about improving some of your 11i processes, then talk about some of the changes to R12 processes and procedures that you should be implementing to your during your upgrade. And then we're going to open it up at the end for about five or ten minutes of questions and answers. So feel free to enter your questions in the chat or the question section. So let's first talk about why should you be doing security during your upgrade. There's a number of reasons and the key here is you can get a lot of benefit from security wise during your upgrade without actually a lot of effort or changes. Because what's happening is during your upgrade, you're doing functional stress testing, technical testing. So a lot of the security enhancements, some of the controls enhancements, actually need a lot of testing, but you don't really have to have your own test cycles. So your upgrade team is actually going through our functional testing of the application. They hopefully are going to be doing a performance and stress testing. And we talk about turning on some features like auditing. Well, if you just turned on auditing without doing the upgrade, you'd have to go through an entire testing cycle performance-wise to make sure the auditing doesn't impact the application anyway. Well, when you're doing your upgrade, you're going to be doing those performance testing cycles anyway. So why not enable the auditing during the upgrade process and then therefore you get a free um, testing cycle for your upgrade <coughs> uh, for turning on auditing and some other features that you would have to do that testing otherwise. Another area is technology stack upgrades. When you go to R12, you have to update the database, the application server. Um, you can reset your security patches, so it's actually a great time to get caught up on a lot of things that you weren't doing in security, especially around security patching. And finally, as you go through the R12 upgrade process, a lot of customizations have to be modified. Um, they won't work out of the box for R12, and so you're actually going to have to go through and review those customizations. Well, it's a great time to how about updating your development standards, putting in new security reviews as part of those customizations. Someone's going to have to go look through those anyways, so why not add a few questions regarding security? How are interface accounts done? Are you FTPing versus SSHing, um, which would be more secure, and things like that. So actually, it's a really good time to add some security in, and one of the goals of this presentation is to show you some things that you can do to improve the overall security without actually a lot of effort, a lot of time spent, and try to take advantage of some of the processes and tests happening already in the R12 upgrade. So the typical R12 upgrade project would look like this. this is a standard evaluate, plan, test, upgrade, and then do a post-upgrade. And what typically happens in R12 upgrade projects is security is just not even included anywhere. The project team is so worried about just trying to get the upgrade in trying to make it work, they're not thinking about security. Well, as we just kind of talked through, you can actually add in security without a lot of effort, hopefully without a lot of risks to the overall upgrade project by adding a number of tasks in. And so when we kind of go through those tasks, each of these stages here, you can add in some security tests. 
Um, I'll first talk about the technical security tasks you might want to add, and then Jeff's going to talk about some related to more internal controls and processes and procedures. But as during the evaluate process, why not do a quick security and compliance gap analysis? Talk to your internal controls team, talk to your IT security team, and see what are they missing? What do they think that should be included? Look at some of the new technology stack and application features. There's a number of security improvements we'll talk out about throughout this presentation that you can implement. Some of them are actually fairly easy to implement and actually help, help you dramatically. One is um, lost password functionality. You can reduce the number of calls to your help desk to reset passwords by having self-service password resets. Another, uh, during your planning stage, look and plan in some of those new security features. When you're doing the customization security reviews, add in a few processes there. As you go to the test step, <clears throat> you can actually add in the new security features and then actually functionally and technically test those without actually putting in a lot of effort. Your team is going to have to go through and actually do a number of functional tests. Well, if you add in some new audits, some new controls, you can actually test those without a lot of effort because they're already being tested. Performance testing is another key one. Auditing is very seldom implemented with the Oracle e Business Suite, and a lot of times performance is a concern. This is an actually easy time now that the R12 upgrade project is going to say, hey, we need to be going through a performance testing cycle. Well, if the auditing is on during that performance testing, you're pretty sure it's going to be well tested and won't have any impact when you go into production. Then during the actual upgrade, this is a great time now to get caught up with your security patches. Most organizations are 12 to 18 months behind, and when you do the upgrade, apply the latest security patches then, and, <clears throat> and also move forward with a new plan to apply security patches on a regular basis. Then finally, on the post-upgrade, look at implementing new security process and improvement. Do a post-upgrade security review, because there are some things that change, new database accounts added with default passwords and things that you need to be aware of after you've done the upgrade, and, it, and you can catch them now versus doing it 12 months from now. And so if you have that cycle and those testing points as part of the upgrade project, you can do these things and get them in process and actually take some of the advantages of those free testing cycles and things like that. I'll let Jeff now talk about some of the control um, issues that you can actually implement as part of your upgrade project. Excellent. Thanks, Steve. And that's a great recap on, on some of the technical challenges and some ideas for um, putting those into the, the upgrade process. So I'll talk a little bit more about um, controls, more application security related topics, um, and just controls in general. So from an evaluation perspective, I think there's uh, quite a few unaddressed or unidentified risks that organizations have yet to mitigate or, or put controls in place related to. So re review, um, you know, various white papers, books, different topics out there that identify additional risks. Um, SQL form access is a good example, and uh, trigger-based auditing, C alluded to that a little bit, um, helps mitigate some of those risks. So that would be looking through those uh, the risk population, adding some risks into your risk library, and determining how you're going to put those controls in place to, to mitigate, or mitigate some of those risks. Um, review mitigation of upgrade risk. I talk a lot about that in, in the, my application security book, which in essence is, um, says how are we addressing the risk that patches apply um, and make changes to security configurations, whether they're server settings or database accounts, or actually making changes to application security menus, request groups, and such. Uh, how are you addressing those risks, and then potentially plan for um, uh, addressing those? So, and then the, the evaluation, considering informal policies and procedures, we see a lot um, of times that there are informal processes, like uh, maybe application security change management doesn't happen that often. Um, so there's not formal documentation on uh, the policies and procedures related to that. Now would be a time to, as, as you're, you know, doing the upgrade process and enhancing your controls, is to formalize some of those. So on the plan stage, um, formalizing the informal, um, which I just alluded to, uh, identifying some additional software that can assist from a security perspective. And there's a lot of different types of software out there. Um, Steve and I can both certainly address questions on that topic um, as we get to the Q&A section, section and afterward. Um, integrate security and controls improvements in the upgrade plan. In general, from a, from a project plan where you're implement, implementing the application from scratch or upgrading, we see that um, the, the definition of security controls, um, which 
there's always a balance between security and operational efficiency, um, between controls and operational efficiency. So uh, what often the elements off of that is often missing is the um, the more internal control review you're, you're typically during an up implementation upgrade, focusing more on operational efficiency and effectiveness, but not necessarily um, you know having somebody from the internal controls perspective. And I'll talk about that in, in my recommendations towards the end. And then planning certainly addressing new risks that you haven't identified. Um, we often see that SOX has been very well um, monitored, mitigated, uh, talked to death, um, but there's definitely some risks beyond starving SOX with your US based corporation that don't get addressed. So, for the testing process, as Steve uh, alluded to very well, um, testing new configurations, new processes, and controls, um, integrate the testing of new software for implementing you know, some new SOD software or um, trigger-based auditing or data security software, those type of things, um, certainly that, that's the time to do it. During the upgrade process, um, executing the upgrade plan, including both automated and manual changes, uh, you may you know, decide that you're implementing new fixed asset security for books, so some manual changes that have to happen to book security, taking advantage of you know, the MOAC features, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, and uh, you need to set up some new things, both um, from a manual perspective. And then certainly during the upgrade process, training of employees on new features um, and processes, whether they're features of the application or new control procedures. Um, post upgrade, um, she rigorously monitor changes. I, I see a lot of organizations assume that, for example, their change management process is effective and everybody's following it, but uh, very, I don't want to say very few, but more often than not, we see um, not. A, uh, a robust um, and rigorous monitoring of that process. So um, that would be one thing. And I, and I put this on here, migrate to role-based access control. We'll talk about role-based access control in a little bit. Um, if you're making significant changes to, um, to security configurations, um, what I find is, is evolving to uh, role-based access control can, can be a, a challenge during the upgrade process, and sometimes it may be a post-upgrade step. So. So the next thing we're going to talk about is some new R12 security features. Those of you that are either have recently implemented or um, are evaluating implementation will recognize some of these. We'll talk through some specific ones that uh, that I think you should be considering. So one of the things that Oracle's been you know touting for a long time is multi-org access control, which is the ability to see uh, see and interact with the, uh, the application across operating units. Um, it can have a uh, significant impact in, in those areas where we have a shared service center um, or shared components, uh, shared data entry or data inquiry across operating units. Uh, MOAC is a very valuable feature. There's been cases where I've worked with clients that, you know, for example, from a data entry perspective, they don't want to implement MOAC. They want to have AP data entry you know, clearly delineated between one operating unit and another one. Um, whereas, you know, when it comes down to inquiry access, um, they have implemented, you know, MOAC across multiple operating units for, you know, AP personnel purchasing, general ledger accounting people. So there's some planning that goes involved uh, as part of the, the, the when do we use MOAC, how do we use MOAC, and certainly from, a, from an operational perspective, to see the least application as it can have a significant impact. So you talk about restrictions on localizations. Um, I did a, did a web blog. Uh, about a month or so ago on MOAC and the impact of MOAC with uh, localizations. And the short version of it is if you're using localizations, um, you're not able to take advantage of all the features of MOAC because localizations apply profile options at, at the responsibility level and you can't apply multiple um, localization uh, profile options to, uh, to a MOAC responsibility. So there's a web blog on our website that goes into more detail on that and that does identify an, an enhancement request. Uh, we were the first ones um, earlier this year to identify that as an enhancement request. We're trying to get the word out on that, so definitely uh, take a look at that. Um, Subliser so architecture is, uh, is a dramatic change and shift in the way that uh, Oracle does Subliser to GL interaction in R12. Um, the one thing I'll point out, and, and, and I've got a web blog on this topic as well, is the ability to enter journal, journal entries through subledgers or make journal lines through subledgers. And that really has a very significant impact on the, what are often key controls related to journal entries, whether it's the workflow approval process, 
the, or um, or manual process that happens outside the system, the uh, that's a pretty significant risk that I would encourage you to go look at. So the whole introduction, the SLA architecture, um, those the, 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 the menu related to that um, gets um, distributed quite a bit throughout the, the uh, application because of the way the menus are are configured, and uh, and more than likely you'll have to mitigate the risk of this uh, these SLA menus coming in and, and being accessible. Um, you know, you have to mitigate those by removing those from various responsibilities or, or changing and making new sub menus or custom sub menus to address that. So I want to go into this upgrade risk. Um, definition access test, data access test are two features um, from a GL perspective that help um, provide better security uh, related to, to various components in the GL in reference to data definition access sets and then how um, the uh, data is accessed um, uh, through the general ledger as it relates to data access sets. So those are both great new features that Oracle's introduced. There's a bug out there. Um, I think I uh, have a web blog coming up on the definition access sets. I haven't, I think if I've done that one or not, but there is um, there's a bug in that process um, where somebody can turn off the security. It's kind of a stupid thing Oracle uh, failed to address when they did the, the rollout of def definition access sets. But um, I'll have a web blog on that up pretty soon. And if you have any questions on that, um, it just requires some personalization that needs to be addressed. So those are some of the new um, R12. Uh, features. So I'm going to talk through, Steve and I are both going to talk through role-based access control. Um, and I always like to talk about role-based access control as a concept. It's, it's not necessarily technology. Oracle makes, wants to make you believe that their user management module is, um, uh, is necessary for um, role-based access control. And the, the point really uh, I have a half a chapter in my book on this because I think it's, it takes a lot of discussion and understanding this. But the whole concept of RBAC is it's a it's a more of a process than it is a technology. And most organizations have a hard time um, getting to the point where they have um, their access controls defined and tied to a role. Um, in Oracle's terms, often what that means is uh, you have multiple responsibilities that have to be assigned to a person or a group of people um, encompassing the role when you're doing um, security administration. So the, the biggest challenge that I see for organizations is not the implementation of the technology, um, if the technology indeed should be implemented, and in lots of cases it shouldn't, but it's more the definition of the roles and having um, a change process um, related to those role definitions as uh, as things evolve. And, and, and the evolution could be something as simple as you know, one person leaving the company and shifting departments, and then all of a sudden a role um, that that person has been playing gets shifted into two or three roles because part of their work gets broken up. So role-based access control, again, is more of a process. Um, I'll let Steve talk through some of the technology implications within Oracle. So with regard to RBAC and Oracle at this point in R12, our experience so far with a number of our clients has been to use it at a limited basis is very good for those common responsibilities. So if you have an employee or kind of employee responsibility, so it might be expenses or I procurement or something like that that's going across many, many different users, RBAC makes a lot of sense because now you can assign one role to every single user in your organization and then assign one or two responsibilities. Then if those responsibilities change rather than going through and maybe doing some direct SQL updates or other difficult ways to change responsibilities assigned to every user, now you just simply change the role. Um, so typically you can get down to a few roles that t are used by maybe a couple hundred users each versus trying to get down to saying, well, I've got my GL person in London office and they are responsible for Europe. That is very difficult to do, but if you just kind of say, okay, we're going to do five roles and we know we've got employee role, we've got manager role, we might have a Europe user role, those kind of work fairly well, especially when there's those responsibilities assigned out to many, many different people. Um, but if you're trying to gather up a list of responsibilities that are maybe assigned to one or two people, our back kind of falls apart at that point. Um, so limited usage of it is very good, especially when you're taking a few responsibilities and have to assign them broadly. Um, so that's kind of been our experience so far with RBOC. I think I don't know if Jeff has some more comments on that. 
I, I totally agree on that. I mean, I, I definitely recommend a uh, an evaluation, a strategic evaluation of, of using the tool versus not using the tool when you have used the tool. And I, I guess I just echo your comments that if you use it wisely, don't necessarily get uh, you know so concerned about broadly deploying it. So another major enhancement to R12 is user management. So Oracle has spent actually a lot of time trying to improve the whole user management and trying to take the hours out of the process. And so what some of the key things are is you have a system administrator who's kind of handling user requests constantly, trying to do foregone passwords that may be a user administrator or a help desk. Well, a lot of those processes that tend to be manually intensive, Oracle has actually spent a lot of time trying to come up with creative ways, workflows, approvals, those type of things to fix it. The first one is new user registration. So you can either register for the first time or request access to a new responsibility through some new approvals and workflows within R12. Um, so if you have a user who wants a new responsibility versus now sending to their manager and the manager then has to fill out a form and send that to someone, that can all be done through the Oracle Business Suite through their existing ID and they can actually say, well, I want this responsibility then a whole workflow process with approvals all gets kicked off automatically and it's actually fairly simple to do um, with not a lot of hours. Another area is login assistance. So a lot of hours are spent by help desk people just resetting forgotten passwords, forgotten usernames, especially if you're using a lot of the self-service modules. Um, it happens quite often, especially in employee self-service where they may go in once a year or twice a year to change their name or an address or something like that. Well, now if they forget their password, they can get it in via email, reset it automatically and those type of things, just like you do at a normal website like Amazon or eBay. Another area is creating users with strong one-time passwords. One of the major control risks that we identify frequently for our clients when we do our security assessments is that they're using the common welcome one password for all new users. Well, now you can very easily go through and actually when you create the user, it will actually email the user with a one-time strong password. So there's a number of enhancements in user management and a lot of times you just move to R12 and you don't spend a lot of time implementing these, but these can both improve security and reduce the hours you spend on user administration. Another feature in R12 that on the surf surface seems very good, but when you kind of start talking about the control risks, causes a huge significant problem. So Oracle's introduced proxy user, and this is the classic functionality to allow the executive assistant to actually go in as the executive's account, maybe the executive assistant to the CEO, and actually do some of their job functions. Well, there's a number of problems in the implementation that don't properly track and audit what's happening. So any transactions created by that assistant would be still completely marked as the executive and you'd have no idea what the executive actually did and what the assistant did unless you actually went through the logs and mapped them back by time. Um, so there's no additional audit trail that happens on that. So we generally recommend you avoid that type of functionality with proxy user. But there is a common problem within the Oracle Business Suite about scheduling concurrent jobs. And there is no way to generically schedule concurrent requests. Um, so you can't say, well, just for general ledger, we'll schedule these. Well, today, those have to be scheduled under a unique account. And that's an individual account, typically. Or if you want to have some internal controls issues, you create the generic account and then have give multiple people access to it. Well, if you use proxy user, you can actually get around that problem by still creating the generic account for scheduled jobs. But what you can do now is throw away the password to that generic account, but now use proxy user to actually assign out to individuals who should have access to that account and allow them then to see jobs, schedule jobs, make sure the jobs ran, view the error logs and things like that. So this is actually a very beneficial feature for a very specific problem that many organizations are kind of dinged on when the internal and external auditors come in and look at the system and know what they're doing on the Oracle Business Suite. And if your auditors haven't identified that you're potentially using generic accounts to schedule, uh, such as GL posting jobs and things like that, um, typically they will find it at some point. And the proxy user is one way to get around that issue because now you still have the generic account scheduling it, but you ha at least have an audit trail of who's using it when. I um, mean, you can get a little bit more granularity in terms of 
uh, controls and audits on that. It doesn't completely solve the problem, but it actually makes the situation a lot better. So that's proxy user. Now I'll talk about just a couple of very detailed technical issues with regard to the Oracle Business Suite security. Um, a lot of issues are around direct database access, and anything you can do to limit that direct database access is beneficial. And R12 does come up with a couple of features, so if you are an internal auditor or responsible for kind of security and control, these are some of the things that you should be pushing down to your DBAs. One is now it's possible to lock the database accounts, all except for the apps account. So anyone familiar with the Oracle Business Suite, there's 300 database accounts that are installed with the product. Well, the apps account still has to be used and is unlocked, but all those other accounts can actually be locked automatically and don't need to be used. And this actually <coughs> reduces risk because the account shouldn't be used at all, but a lot of times people are going in as them. So this is a good way to lock the account. So there's a new feature um, as part of AFW Pass that can lock those. Also, you can actually use case-sensitive passwords for database accounts, which is kind of a cool. It's 2010, and Oracle finally implemented that for one, the database, and now the Oracle Business Suite. And then finally, there's an Apple Sys Public password. The typically, the password is pub, and it actually gives you a view into the application. You really can't do much with it, but if there's any security vulnerabilities or things like that, somebody can exploit very easily. Um, so now you can actually change that password. Um, so these are just kind of some very tactical things, but when you but it kind of raises the awareness when you're going through your R12 upgrade. There's lots of little things you can do and lots of little features that are implemented. Um, and these are just a couple that just reduce overall risk uh, and provide you a little bit more secure environment. Um, there's a number of these. Uh, there's a number of white papers. If you look at Integrity's website or Jeff's ERP Risk Advisor's website, we kind of document these out to kind of say, here's some of the things that you should be thinking about when you do your R12 upgrades. Another kind of tactical point here for anyone running credit cards, um, if when you were prior on 11i and you're running credit cards through your environment, Oracle Business Suite is not a certified credit card application, so it's actually deemed non-compliant. So when you upgrade, when you're going to 12.1, it is a compliant application with credit cards, but you do have to actually enable the encryption. So if you are running through credit cards through the Oracle Business Suite, you do have to spend a little bit of time and effort making it truly compliant. Um, the first step is upgrading, but then there's a number of manual steps that also have to be done. Um, just let everyone be aware of that. And this is a big change. So if your auditors have come in and are looking at PCI compliance uh, with regard to credit cards, um, you have to be make sure you're on 12.1 when you upgrade. So that's kind of some of the new features in R12. Now let's talk about how to improve upon security from 11i, some of the things that you can do that are specifically changes from your 11i to your R12 environment. Great, thanks Steve. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk through uh, a couple different topics here. We're going to start with uh, consider some new software. Um, Steve made the point that, you know, in the beginning of the presentation, that the, the testing process is ideal to um, introduce new processes and software. So there's a couple of things to think about. Um, SOD software, you know, there's a lot of uh, Oracle software. Together. There's a, several other products that have uh, SOD software in the marketplace um, as well. It's a good time to implement it, especially if you're going to do um, preventive controls uh, within the context of that, which is a lot of times where you get the most value. Um, the area where I see organizations really are deficient from a controls monitoring perspective is, is the absence of a, uh, a trigger log-based technology to develop uh, the before and after value audit trails. So Steve and I have been talking about that topic for a long time and really have led the dialogue in the industry on that, but we still see that there are a lot of organizations that don't have what I would call an auditable system because they don't have the ability to track changes, um, primarily inserts and updates, but even deletes within the database uh, at the table level. So perfect time to do it because you have the performance testing and all the stuff that goes along with uh, some of the uh, often our concerns related to these uses of those technology. Uh, external security analysis, um, integrity software is a great tool to use for that type of thing, um, both during the upgrade process to identify the risks uh, and then on an ongoing basis so that's, uh, they have their software for that. Um, and then allowing for why, why do you want to use some of these tools, which is really allowing for the monitoring of SQL forms. The, the, the areas that I think organizations really fall down on from a change management perspective is activity through uh, SQL forms, 
and configurations related to key controls. Those are probably by far the most significant risks that organizations haven't uh, have mitigated. You really need to have a trigger log based technology and and, and um, something to to identify and lock down some of those um, critical forms that are often a part of the SOD software. So they obviously do more than just SOD, these single function and single form risks as well. So those are a few things. Um, you know, you certainly want to do a better job of monitoring your change management process and, and put some additional processes and controls in. So there's software considerations potentially. Um, one other thing that's not on the slide I'll mention is some data security software. And uh, Oracle, as an example, doesn't encrypt everything that you, you want to protect. Um, the sensitive data within your organization is, is often unique to your organization, but there are certain categories of information that aren't protected. I'll just give you one example, which is um, bank accounts for suppliers and employees. Um, that are being paid to ACH, uh, that data is not protected at the database level. Um, and there's probably a dozen examples we can we can look at within the context of HR data. And uh, so there's some software that can be used to secure that data at the, at the database level using native database technologies. So the next slide, Steve. Um, so fix what was broken, and, and this is uh, designing or redesigning your application security, your support procedures, your change management process. Uh, there's a lot I could talk. I talk for a whole webinar just on this topic, but privilege user access or, or super user access. Um, certainly, uh, a lot of organizations still have business analysts or end users or a variety of different people that have. Um, what we would consider privileged user access, and now is the time to address that both from a process perspective as well as uh, the impact of that from a security perspective um, or security design perspective. Um, let's see, this lost, there we go. Uh, access, uh, excessive access to configurations by end users, it kind of goes hand in hand. Um, kind of, an end user that has uh, significant access to configurations, I would consider a privileged user, but certainly within the context of the configuration change management process, which a lot of organizations have an informal process, but even more formally um, uh, identifying what, what forms should be going through change management, making sure security aligns with that, and then having a QA process to, to monitor those, um, whether, whether some of those things are being done by end users or IT users. Uh, access to transactions by IT personnel. Again, you have a lot of VAs that have access to transactions, and there's certainly other ways and better ways to do do support for the applications than than giving um, VAs or IT personnel uh, access to um, the complete you know cycle, including configurations and transactions. Um, usage of generic or vendor supplied user accounts. You touched on that a little bit. It's just another you know comment. You know, this is back to setting up those generic users for scheduling jobs, the disabling uh, vendor supplied accounts so they can't be used. Um, in some cases, if you have like sysadmin, I, I often see the sysadmin generic user or vendor supplied user um, with a lot of responsibilities because they're using that. So it's, it's whittling that back down to what you really need from a patching perspective. Um, and then not monitoring activities for SQL forms. You know, the, the, the question I always ask uh, a, a group like this is: Are you? Would you be comfortable with employees having access to the app's password in a production environment? And of course, the answer I would come back is, well, no, because that, you know that's that's insane to have somebody give them the ability to, to to execute SQL statements in a production environment. But yet, there are a lot of forms that that allow that. And my favorite example is the alerts form, which I guarantee there are several employees in in, in your environment or most environments have access to that form that can do. In essence, the same thing as having access to the app's password if, they're, if they know what they're doing. So there's 30 some plus forms that allow um, some form of SQL statement or SQL injection to be used, and um, you really have to monitor those. You want to, you want to lock those down from a access perspective, from an application security design perspective, and you would certainly want to monitor the activity for anybody that has access to those in a production environment. So there's a lot more I can say about fixing what was broken. Um, you know, from a, a lot of it ties into application security design. Um, but we'll uh, we'll address specifically these four bullet points. Um, one, the first one, move towards uh, use of more customized responsibilities 
There are a couple cases like I procurement, for example, the, the, the or I expense where the risk is minimal. I say just go ahead and use the, the standard responsibility. So I, I do um, make some allowances for that, but 98% or 99% of all responsibilities should be custom. Um, and those custom responsibilities on uh, point two should always be using um, custom top level menus um, and often are using a significant number of custom sub menus within a top level menu. And that, the, the combination of those two things um, reduces what I consider what I, what I call upgrade risk, um, reduces the risk that when a patch is applied um, and new features or functionality or new functions are being added to a particular menu, um, that, that menu, the access after those patches would be appropriate for users. And it's not that you shouldn't go through a, um, an impact analysis when those patches are being applied. Um, it's just that the impact, that identifying the changes to those menus, and especially those that make significant changes in some menus, is difficult um, within uh, an EBS environment, and you often need some tools to be able to help you do that, um, which, often, which generally is our SOD type tools. Um, so that would be another reason to look at, uh, at, at putting those in place if you don't have them. Uh, the third bullet point, taking into consideration sensitive data. Uh, you really need to have a sense of data policy, what's, what's, what's uh, considered sense of data within your organization, what elements. Um, I often find that organizations don't even have that as a starting point, let alone identifying who, has, who should be authorized to have access to that data, let alone have gone through a very extensive analysis on who has access to that data through the application layer and through um, the technology layer. So uh, from, a, from a project perspective, it's a good time to say we're going to re revisit our security, we're going to look at where our holes are, let's take another look at sensitive data. Sensitive data is not only access to the application, but it's also reports. So it's, um, it ties into the fourth element, better definition of request groups. Um, I see a lot of uh, organizations using standard request groups, and I have you know, certainly identified in, in my work um, a lot of cases where the access to sensitive data through those request groups is inappropriate. Um, you know, I can give you some examples, but my favorite example probably is an, is an organization I went into that was using, um, they were entering employee social security numbers as, as part of the supplier setup, which was mistake number one, but they were doing it nonetheless. Um, and they were paying their employees by ACH. Um, so I went in and, you know, the first day I was there, I ran the supplier's report, uh, which is a seated report, both in some of the AP and purchasing responsibilities. They gave me access to um, every employee's social security number, um, bank account information, home address, which is a pretty significant piece of information on the, on the black market for if you wanted to sell it. So those are some, some ideas for application security designs. Um, Hopefully, I, like I said, I could have gone into a lot, can go into a lot more detail, and maybe at some point later I'll go through a complete, you know, webinar on, on, uh, on this topic. But those are just some ideas to think about. So our 12 process and procedure. I think I'm turning this back over to you, Steve. Ah, no, I'm sorry, it's still me. I apologize. Um, so a couple other comments on processes and procedures. Change management. I, I alluded to this. Um, form, making sure formalization of processes related to, I call it the four lives of change management, configuration change management, which is activity that happens through the application layer, um, through logging into applications or making changes to configurations. Um, my one comment on that is not everything under the setup menu should go through change management. You really have to do some sort of risk assessment process and, and evaluate um, who should be making changes to, uh, to and through what forms. Past change management, fairly self-explanatory. Application security change management, often see that um, that is not formalized, um, or as database security change management is formalized, it's more of an informal process. Um, whereas the, the fourth leg of this component um, is uh, object-oriented security change management or development change man management. I typically see that most organizations have a pretty good control, controls related to that. Uh, second bullet point is a more robust quality assurance process related to change management. You know, you're, you're really, if you have, uh, um, if you don't have a D2A process over your change management, you really are putting your system at risk. 
Um, there are a variety of different levels of expertise and understandings in your organization of who has access to things like critical configurations or profile options. And we've all, uh, as consultants, have been brought into organizations that have, you know, system down issues or functionality change issues, and they don't necessarily know what changed or why something changed. And you know, sometimes it can be days before that change was uh, identified. If you have a good change management process, you've done a risk assessment on the front end, you've got only you know people that are authorized to make those changes have access to, the, to those critical configurations, um, and you've got a monitoring process in place using a system-based audit trail created either by triggers or logs, you have a lot better chance of protecting um, the integrity of your system and, and, and reducing those unapproved changes. Um, again, this is an area I still see a lot of exposure for organizations. Um, they, they don't have the right process or processes or technologies or a combination of those to be able to set up and monitor the change management process. So next slide, Steve. Um, improved controls. Uh, you know, a lot of, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of organizations have done a good job with SOX risk. There's a lot of other risks beyond SOX. Data security, we talked about fraud risks. Um, that's a topic I've, I've talked a lot about over the last couple of years, and then an operational risk specific to your organization. I can't give you the list of here's the top 10 things you need to look at for your organization because the use of your applications and the way you run it and the way you do your business is different from, from business to business, but it certainly helps you evaluate and understand risks um, with the configurations, and then we can talk about how they're being used within your environment. So. Um, that's a big, you know, that's a big challenging process um, for organizations because, in, in theory, um, nobody likes to admit that there are things that uh, risks that haven't been mitigated. Automated controls—that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, using seated workflows, um, building or change processes related to those. Um, personalizations, both through a framework and traditional forms. Use of alerts. You can automate controls a lot depending upon you know what tool you put in place, like trigger-based auditing solutions. Um, there's some good ones out there that have uh, a very you know workflow-driven slash alert-based systems that you can um, you know really develop some some meat to your controls, um, whether it's configuration change management or or changes to data, you know uh, master data, those type of things. Document compliance with, uh, with best practices. Um, Steve alluded to this earlier that uh, integrity was a key part of, uh, of putting together Oracle's best practices document. Um, there's that are available on, on MetaLink or my Oracle support now. Um, I think you should be going through from a from a best practices perspective, if you want to call it that, and just document compliance with everything within those documents. Now, the one caveat I make to that is those documents, um, while they're they're a good starting point, they aren't comprehensive. They Oracle doesn't really maintain those. If you go back and look at the copyright dates or the last updates on those, they have. There's really, I hate to say it this way, but there's really nobody within Oracle that is keeping track of those best practices or developing that. It's one of the biggest flaws that Oracle has in their organizational structure is they just don't build and promote best practices. So, but it is a good starting point. Um, I would definitely build a document compliance with what's, what's published and then seek out experts in other areas to help you identify the, the gaps. So um, we're going to talk kind of try to wrap, wrap up our, our webinar here. So I'll go through a slide here, just some recommendations and Steve will talk about um, his, some of his recommendations. So upgrade um, overall recommendations, process and controls, change committees. If you're, Controls minus person, and then controls are within the purview of your responsibility. Um, what I often find is that there is not a great um, awareness, or, or there's, there's not a, a well-defined processes for changes to your business processes and controls. Um, it, it's a fair, fairly informal process, again, unless you've got a very structured um, corporate governance group with your in your organization, um, which a lot of companies don't. The, uh, the ability, the, the, the process you use to change your business processes and your controls um, is a lot less formal than it needs to be, and, and, and often there's not very well-defined ownership. I mean, obviously the owner, from a SOX perspective, are the signing, the signing officers, but the level below that, which is in essence pr providing all the assurance to the, the signing officers about you know changes being um, 
properly approved and then the, and the, the operating effectiveness is controls in general isn't there um, in a full lot of organizations. So I, I could, again, talk about that for about a half an hour if I wanted. Automate controls where possible. Um, that's already been commented on. Evaluate key controls to reduce audit scope and cost. Again, if you're, um, if whoever helped you design those initial controls, if they didn't understand risk well, or they, you know, I, I guess it comes back to that. If they don't, don't understand risk well, Oftentimes, I've seen a lot of organizations having um, a lot of key controls that really shouldn't be key controls because they're, they're decent mitigating controls. So um, certainly from a from project perspective, you bring us in to help you. Um, that's one of the things we'll try to add value is reducing audit scope, which ultimately reduces cost to your audit. Um, implement technology and processes to better monitor automated controls. I think I've talked on that quite a bit. Um, documenting formal risk assessment process for application security risks. You know, when you're making changes to application security, um, let's just say you make a role change. So like I talked about earlier, somebody that's a real superstar in your organization um, has, you know, three jobs in one. They leave, they transfer, that gets broken up. Um, now you're, you're, you're moving that um, activity, you know, to three different people. That's a, that's a change to the application security control process. That's the change of the application security, making changes to, you know, roles and responsibilities to address that. Um, unless you go back and have a formal document of a risk assessment process that says these are the things that we consider um, risk and, uh, risk of risk in our environment, these are the, these are the things that we're using to mitigate those risks, um, then that, the, 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 the legacy of, of, of a well-defined application security process can get lost very easily if the, the appropriate process isn't put in place. So I have a doc, document that formal risk assessment process for application security risks, and then ultimately tying this back to the process of controls change committee, you've got to have somebody that, that uh, can look at changes, like significant changes to application security from a 360 degree view. Um, and that's you know, certainly one of the, the areas of risk that I see um, organizations have. So that's specific application security risks. But in general, you need to have a, uh, a process to assess and document the results of risk assessment, whether it's a, a generic um, job scheduling user, you know, we've evaluated these risks, this is what we see, this is a mitigating control, let's document it, let's put it in a file so we don't have to revisit this every time auditors come in. Formalizing that process is still something that I, I see a lot of organizations need to, to work on. So I don't, I've, we've gone, I've gone a little bit long. I'm going to turn it over to Steve to, to wrap up with this slide, and I'll be available for Q&A at, uh, at the end of the, the webinar here. Thanks, Jeff. So Jeff talked a lot about the controls side, and so looking back at the security side, as you're going through, you can actually implement a lot of high-value, low-effort security improvements throughout the environment, and especially the controls, you may not be able to get as much of a bang for the buck during the upgrade process, but on the security side, there's a lot of capabilities that you should be implementing, like encryption, auditing, um, those type of things that need a lot of testing effort, but are actually are pretty simple to implement at the end of the day. So for credit card security, if you are running credit cards, to implement the credit card encryption patch might take someone a day. The problem is it makes a massive change to the application, the way it runs, and so it takes a significant amount of time to actually test that change because any time you touch credit cards, you actually have to test to make sure that the change that Oracle has implemented is effective. Well, if you have to do that standalone without an upgrade, it would take a significant amount of effort. But actually during your upgrade process, you can just enable credit card encryption let it go through the standard testing cycles during the upgrade, and you're all done. So basically the net cost of actually implementing encryption would be maybe one day of a DBA's time, and then you just let it go through the standard testing cycle. So there's a lot of things you can do security tasks related during the upgrade that actually gives you a lot of value, and you don't actually have to extend as much effort if, versus when you do it alone without the upgrade. Again, Jeff talked about the best practices for security document. As you're going through your upgrade, you should actually be implementing a lot of those because they don't necessarily make significant changes, but they may change the way the application works or one of your interfaces works. So when you're actually going through the testing cycle, if you implement a lot of the different changes in the best practices document, you get free testing cycles. And then finally, after you're done, you should actually be doing a post-upgrade security validation of some sort. 
um, because a lot of the problems is you're going through the upgrade process. The upgrade is very rigorous, very complex. You're trying to get it done within a 48 or 72 hour window and a lot of things can go wrong. DBAs miss steps and they don't realize something and so now it's live in a production environment and they, they, there may be default passwords or something like that that needs to be actually remediated. So it's very good to actually, after you've done the upgrade, within that week to actually go through a post-upgrade validation to make sure that everything is done right, that the devil in the details, that the DBAs did everything in their checklists, that it, the environment was locked down properly when they were done with the upgrade, because there's a lot of things changed. The entire technology stack gets wiped out or replaced um, with a new application server and things like that, and there's lots of little configuration steps that have to be done. So we'll now open it up for questions and answers. So if you do have any questions, please enter them in the questions box, and I will turn it back over to Phil um, to see if there's any questions. All right. Thank you, Steve and Jeff. Uh, very informative and some great ideas for everybody to consider when they're upgrading their uh, e-business suite. Uh, we do have some questions here. And again, uh, if you have additional questions, please put them in the uh, question section of the, uh, of the webinar. Uh, the first question. If you test changes to the application with the testing of security changes, how difficult is it to determine which cause of fail, failure, or error? I'm not sure Jeff or Steve should answer that one. You want to repeat that again, just so I understand the context of it? If you test the changes to the application with the testing of, for security changes, how difficult is it to determine which cause the failure or error? Um, I think it's fairly simple, actually, because oftentimes the first thing you do when you have, you know, custom responsibility to, to test to make sure that to understand the applications to go back and, and, and use the same seated responsibility to make sure that it acts the same way as your your custom responsibility. So if you're if you're trying to narrow it down between is it something new to the application, is it a configuration change, um, does it act the same way with custom security versus standard security? That's certainly one of the first things you do is uh, is go back and, and, and run that same process through standard responsibilities. Hopefully that answers the question. Okay. Next question. In addition to a lack of an audit trail, is proxy user different than third party user, such as uh, I expenses, and that actions taken by a proxy user do not require approval by the associate? Can you read? So the way the proxy user works is the application just thinks it's that user you're proxying in. So, so when the administrative assistant uses proxy user and they go in this, the CEO's account, it to the application everything looks like it's the CEO in there. The application really doesn't know any different. Um, so it's kind of it's different than the way the expenses work, and that's kind of the control issue is that anything that they can do as the CEO's account would happen. So if, in, in this case, if the CEO is approving the administrative assistant's expense report or something like that, they would enter the expense report as themselves and then they could just proxy in as the CEO's account and actually approve their own expense report. Um, there's nothing blocking that. So it's, it's different than the way the third party user works in expenses. Yeah, if I could just pile on this a little bit to this topic, it's, it's something I probably could have addressed in a regular webinar, but um, one of the, in general, delegation of authority related to workflows. Um, and there's a variety of different ways to do that. You highlighted proxy user because that's the R12 C, but there, even in 11i, there's ways to forward emails, you know, in such a way that, um, you know, somebody gets that user that, that email link and then responds back to the workflow um, without re-authenticating the application. There are ways to, to delegate your authority using vacation rules, as an example. Um, there, I, there's a whole chapter in my book on this this one topic, and, and, and frankly, I think as it relates to delegation of authority, whether you're talking about proxy users or, or some other ways that can happen, um, I, I think a lot of organizations are are not aware of those risks, and you know certainly it would be a good time to drop that during the upgrade as well. All right, number three. Does OBIEE analytics products recognize security features such as definition access sets or data access sets? Um, do you want me to take that one, Steve? Uh, sure. I don't know if you've run into that yet. Well, I think the answer, I'm 99% sure the answer is no, um, because 
the, the function level security, if you will, within EDS isn't really recognized, fully recognized by OBIE. But I, to be honest, I'm not, I'm not positive. I haven't addressed that issue. Um, but I, I, just knowing that there are, you know, the, the, the function security, for example, between is not addressed. So, like for example, uh, I don't know, I won't go into it, but I just say, I'd say probably not, but I'm not real positive to be honest. To be honest. Okay. Next question. What areas have you done the most work with clients during the upgrade cycle? I'm not sure who that's directed to. I think we can both kind of provide an answer there. For Integrity, we do a lot of security assessments, so a lot of our work is actually done uh, prior to the upgrade, so we'll actually evaluate a pre-upgrade environment, actually a determine if there's any security vulnerabilities that they've hardened down the environment and actually kind of then review their upgrade process to make sure all the tasks are taken care of during that. And then a lot of times we'll also then do a post upgrade just to make sure that the environment's hardened, that they haven't missed anything um, during that whole process. Um, and then we'll we actually do some work on the pre planning going through as kind of some of the tasks that we talked about earlier in this presentation. We spend a lot of time with clients uh, going through those, especially ones that haven't implemented auditing, haven't in implemented encryption. So we'll actually have detailed discussions to say, okay, what projects should they be looking at during the upgrade? Um, what can they do? Um, and sometimes it's just during the planning stage that we're saying, yes, implement encryption, implement auditing. But we'll actually talk customers out of some of the things that they want to do. Um, one example recently was they wanted to implement single sign-on, uh, OID, integrate Oracle Business Suite with LDAP during their upgrade process. And we actually recommended that they didn't do that because that's such a high risk type venture. Um, you'd have to do the same amount of testing and work during the upgrade or if you did it separately um, because it's such a change to the application and it provides a lot of risk because if that doesn't work after your upgrade, it's very hard to roll back. Um, so a lot of our effort is just kind of around, okay, here's what you should be doing, here's what you should be looking at, here's kind of the risks that you face as an organization and what challenges you need to fix as you go through your upgrade process. All right, next one. Our security department has concerns about us having a shared file system among the concurrent manager tier and the web farm tier. What is best practice and how can we minimize the risk of this configuration? So it actually got a little bit easier with R12 because in R12, the log files and configuration files are actually separate from a lot of the application code. So in our opinion, it's actually somewhat of a security improvement to have a shared Apple top um, and the Oracle homes between the concurrent manager and web tiers because you're only dealing with one set of code at that point. And you can then also monitor a lot easier in that if you put a file change auditing tool, uh, something like a tripwire, you can actually see that any code changes are occurring when they're occurring and that they're occurring outside any normal change window. So if the DBA is not applying a patch, there really should never be a change to the Apple top. And the key there is all the log files, any the files that change on a routine basis are kept in the uh, instance tops. And so you can monitor much easier versus then having to monitor a set of Apple tops. Maybe if you have two or three application servers and two or three concurrent manager servers, you might be monitoring five or six servers. If you actually keep the code in one place, it's actually a little bit easier to monitor. You do have the shared access component of that from multiple systems through an NFS mount or something like that, but um, typically that's more the manifold piece. Um, it's very nice to know that you only have to apply a patch once, not to five different systems, um, and you don't have to manage those individual code sets. And then you can much easier know that if a change is making to that set of code that it's happening in one place and you know who's typically doing it. So that's kind of our response to it. We actually recommend that a lot of customers implement um, the shared Apple tabs. All right, next question. Is there a Net, uh, Metalink node or new user, I can't, excuse me, let's <laughs> try this again. Is there a Metalink node or new user registration functionality? If so, can you share that information? I don't think there's actually a MetaLink note on it. It's part of the system administrator guide. Um, as part of that guide, there's three different books. It's, in, it's actually documented to the extent that Oracle documents anything as part of the security book. Um, so it's actually documented in there. Probably not to the way you'd want it to be documented, but it's okay documentation. 
So you should first look there um, and then probably open a support request if you have any additional questions. Yeah, and I would say that there are quite a few uh, white papers out in there. So um, if you're not a member of OUG, then there, you should be because there's got a lot of good white papers on, on user management in general that have been presented at the various uh, conferences for the last five or six years. Next question. You recommended customer responsibilities menus and submenus. Do you think it's necessary to create custom functions as well? Why or why not? Um, custom functions. No, I don't think it's necessary to create custom functions. Um, I mean, other than the fact that you're going to be creating some custom functions that are read-only and um, using the query only equals yes um, parameter. I, I guess I don't see the risk in, in the reason to create custom functions because you know I think there's more risk in creating a custom function, frankly, and maintaining all those than there probably is using custom functions. I just work with those functions for a reason, um, and certainly you know I, I can understand that the function may change, you know, if you're upgrading, um, and there is a risk to that. But I think that the the, the primary Identification, let's say a form changes and adds add some new features or adds new some new fields, um, which I guess it would be a risk to sensitive data in some cases uh, transactions. Those should come out during user testing. So, um, you know, I guess I'll backtrack a little bit. I guess I do see some risks, but I very, very rarely, well, I guess I've never seen a client that's done extensive custom functions just to not use the standard functions. and. Even if you're creating custom, func custom functions, the underlying forms, you still have the rest of those things being changed. So I, I don't think it's, I don't know, see that yeah, I'll just kind of, I don't see any value in creating custom functions. No, because it's, just, it's so complex and just would take so long. You're better to dedicate that time and effort somewhere else. That right. would be the simplest answer. All right, next question. What are some of the trigger based audit systems that you talked about earlier? Um, we've implemented a couple of them. Um, Oracle certainly has one in their suite, the CCG product, Configuration Controls Governor. Um, there is uh, probably the favorite one that I've implemented is from Chaos, the CS audit tool. Um, uh, Absolute uh, Technologies has a product out there that's trigger based auditing that's very good and very mature. Um, I'm missing one. Um, I'll think of it in a second. Uh, Greenlight Technologies is another one. That's, that's what I was trying to think of from a trigger-based auditing perspective. Uh, and so those are the four I can think of off the top of my other trigger. Do you think of that, Steve, off the top of your head? Um, no, kind of give you a little background on the question also. There's kind of a, several different types of auditing solutions. So you can either do it a trigger-based, which would be happening in the database, but would be very application-aware. And so those would be the products that Jeff was talking about, or there's just pure database auditing. So those would be products like Imperva, Guardium, IBM, or Oracle's Audit Vault. And the advantage of the trigger-based auditing solutions, and why kind of Jeff talks about them, is that they are much more application-aware. So they're giving you, well, this is kind of the data that changed versus pure auditing tools that just show you the SQL statement. So you may see. Um, for like a pure auditing solution that's just auditing SQL, it would say, well, the vendor AP vendor all table vendor ID five was updated to value six, and so you have no real idea what's happening, and that's why some of the trigger-based auditing solutions are beneficial in an application context like this, because they're giving you that I change vendor uh, McDonald's from. 30-day uh, net pay to 60-day net pay, and you actually get that true information, that application-aware context, which is very important. Yeah, we you and know, I talk a lot about this, this topic. You know, I think there's pros and cons to all the technologies. I mean, there's no one technology that you'd say you'd recommend for all cases. Um, so I think it's important when you're addressing the requirements to maybe consult with Steve and or myself because um, we have, you know, different skill sets and different perspectives um, on where things, you know, are beneficial than the others. I, I typically focus much more on application level um, controls, as Steve mentioned, and, and triggers are, are better, I think, than any other technology out there. 
Um, but certainly, you know, there are other there are other advantages of using other technologies that Steve mentioned. Um, that they have those over trigger based technologies that you tell me to have a you know a good discussion on on what your objectives are, what your requirements are, and then what technology best fits that. Uh, 